Today, uh, I'm in conversation with Sarah Klass, composer and singer-songwriter. Hello, Sarah, welcome. Hello, thanks, Alison. <laughs> so, Sarah is, is one of our um, most talented British composers and songwriters. She has worked on landmark documentary natural history programs such as Attenborough's Africa and Madagascar, which um, has been Emmy nominated. She has a new album coming out, uh, Natural High, and an EP called Green Man. Um, how, are you, how are you coping with being in splendid isolation at the moment, Sarah? Does it suit you as, as an artist who lives in their imagination? Well, I, I'm loving actually having the time to be creative at home and, and um, just channeling all that inspiration in, into, I don't know, into my hands and out into somewhere else where people can hear it. But um, yes, it's great just, just being in nature where I live. And so I'm sitting in my little studio and just focusing. Uh, it's almost like having permission to, to get on with it, <laughs> to get on with it and be creative. So I'm loving that at the moment. Um, it's obviously really very hard for everybody. And I have to say that listening to your EP Green Man, um, was wonderfully med meditative and great. gave me great, great solace in, in difficult times. And are you finding that, that it's actually very therapeutic for you to be concentrating on, on your music and your forthcoming yeah. album at, that's, that's true. in, in that's an very extraordinary good situation? Yes, it is. It's, um, there's so, so much, uh, you know, emotion going on. And every day I was just talking to my partner, Ben, and just feel different about things. And um, you have new emotions coming up. Um, and I think it is very therapeutic. And the, the, the music that I'm writing at the moment has that uh, healing quality. And particularly Green Man, the reason I wanted to write Green Man was, I think, just to try to just show the quality of, of nature's healing. And I'm hoping that that's coming across. Uh, I'm, I'm hearing some good things about it, so. Oh, it, it really does. And I, I really enjoyed watching the video that accompanies Green Man, which goes, explores the seasons yes, in it nature. Um, I th felt that there was um, a wonderful continuity in that, that, that life will go on and that that's very reassuring and grounding as, as well as also being extraordinarily um, calming and meditative. How, how do you get into the zone to create your music and your composition, Sarah? What, what's your artistic process? Um, well, I think uh, there's a lot of things that I do. Um, to get into the zone, I often meditate, actually. Um, I might meditate and do yoga. Uh, before you actually start work yes try to meditate before i do if, if it's something specifically um i don't that, that i really want to get the very very i always want to get the very best out of my music but if there's something that i'm really really um holding with with kid gloves then i might i'll always meditate anyway because that makes you feel better but it, it certainly opens the the creative um channels so that doing yoga being in nature a little walk um but i would just sometimes sit at the piano um and um very often just see what comes and i mean songs will come into my head little tunes and i would hear all the different parts you know the bass parts the rhythm the, the melody the harmony um and i'd just try and write that down as quickly as i can before that disappears that's if I'm by the piano. By the piano, I don't feel the pressure um, that sitting in front of my computer uh, lends me a little bit. So um, it, it's a different kind of process. And if I'm out and about for a walk, um, that's quite a good way to get ideas, you know. But they'll pop into my head when I least expect them. So I never know. How, how long does it take to bring a, a new um, piece of music to fruition? What, what, what's the time length? Or does it does it totally depend on how it's how it's flowing for you as an artist? Um, well, it just just depends on what it is. If it's a film, um, yeah, it depends how much music they want. Uh, I so, guess they also give you a deadline, and, and yes, I mean, do you, do you get 
sometimes yeah. quite short deadlines? Yeah, some of them are really short. Um, I did the Meerkats, that film. Um, it was, I think, I can't remember the year now, but that, that film took, that was, I only had 10 days to write that. Uh, I should have had- It doesn't like very long. No, you would, you'd imagine probably maybe a couple of months. Um, yeah. But uh, there was high pressure on that one and, and managed to come up with at least 40 or 50 minutes of music, probably over an hour actually. And there's, that was, yes, I, that nearly killed me, but <laughs> you wouldn't normally want to do things like that. But a good deadline does, uh, focus, it does, focus, does it creativity. It does focus it, yes, it does. So, so in comparison, how long did you have to create the music for the award-winning BBC series Africa, which Sir David Attenborough narrated, which um, has been hugely successful? Yes. Um, but, and your music is incredible. Oh, thanks, Alison Jane. Um, I think it was about, I remember doing the series over a year, um, but actually each episode, um, I would have my own deadline of, of two or three weeks because uh, I think it was about three weeks, but because then we needed to record it with the orchestra. So we did, I did the initial writing, um, had that approved, and then we had to have, to have all the recording dates in place uh, in order to, um, or we knew where we were in the schedule. Um, and then we would record at, uh, I think it was Air Lindhurst we recorded at, and uh, Angel Studios in London. Um, and then after that, we mixed it at Abbey Road. So the whole thing, probably about five weeks per episode. And the music is by turns epic, violent, um, soothing, sensual. How, how do you get into all these different moods? Does it totally come from, from watching the, the footage? Yes, I, I would say so. Uh, the inspiration of, comes from all sorts of areas uh, for these things. Uh, when, it's, when it's a film or television, you are very much focused on, on the pictures and uh, you will possibly have some direction uh, from the director with the music that, that is there already. So for example, um, the, there's a famous part with the two giraffes um, having a fight. Um, that I wanted to have sort of a juxtaposition of vocals, high, high soprano vo vocals over a sort of soaring uh, violin section. Um, and then there was, there was a ho whole lot of different kind of things happening there. So the pictures are primarily your inspiration. Then you've got the place, although I didn't want to do traditional African music because I, I didn't feel it was a, appropriate. It was more about the story and it was very story driven, uh, Africa, the whole thing. And that's what made it so fun to write music for. So you've got lots of different la levels going on and layers because you've got with wildlife, it's difficult because you know you you lend an emotion to the scene, and I think it's important that you do that because um, it's a it's it's, all, it's come up actually in conversation about having emotional situations with animals um, because of course you know you don't know what's going on in the animal's head what what really is happening how you put your stamp on it just changes the whole scene musically so um very simply you could you could put a very soft piece of music juxtaposing um some violent act and that could actually be even more um you know powerful powerful impactful yes so there's all sorts of ways of doing it but but i think with emotion it it in music with nature programs it sells conservation and that's a really important uh, point to remember that um, if people see these animals they feel something then they're going to want to preserve them and that was my thinking all the way through Africa. Um, yeah, I, these that, documentaries have become terribly important particularly the ones yeah. Attenborough mm -hmm. is helming for, for that reason because we we are now cannot fail to be aware of the crisis with uh, endangered species. Absolutely yes. And so these these documentaries have the power to make people care. Exactly. That's that's just what I want. And that's what I want with everything that I do when I write music. 
Do you, do you think, that brings me on to an interesting question, do you think you have, uh, do you see that you have a great responsibility with the work you do, working on nature documentaries to communicate the urgency of action and to also take that into um, being involved in the World Land Trust, that you lend your artistic voice to documentaries, but you do care on a, a personal level and get involved in conservation projects. Do you, do you think you have a responsibility to do that as an artist? Well, it depends on the kind of artist you are. For me, I, yes, because it's so important to me. Um, doing natural history programs, anything to do with wildlife, I feel if there is any way that I can help the, the preservation and protection of these species, and many of them endangered, um, that I want to do that with my music and particularly I, I am such an environmental, environmentally orient, orientated person that I, I make, I go out of my way to do that um, and that's you know with my doing my music with the World Land Trust and trying to help raise awareness of their work and raise funds um, that I'll do anything I can so I'm always looking for opportunities to do that. That's my bag, I don't know about other people but but that's what I want to do and that's what gives me meaning in my life is is to help this beautiful planet um, because we only have this beautiful planet and we need to preserve it. It's precious. I think, I think the thing is you know as, as someone who interviews people in the public eye the public do see people that they admire as role models and it's about whether you decide to take up that mantle or not to be a, a role model if you're working on natural history programs that you mm you actually care about them yes. in your own, own life as well. Yeah. Um, you also, I mean, there's no doubt that you have an absolute love for nature. Where, where does that come from, Sarah? Tell, tell me about growing up uh, on the Isle of Wight. Were you surrounded by nature as a child? Yes, what does it mean to you? Yes, it's, this is, well, it was everything to me and, and my childhood there, uh, I think, laid the foundations for for my love of nature throughout my life so yes it, I grew up in the woods of um, the north of the Isle of Wight and um, my father was a biologist um, and and ran a nature reserve we still own today it's uh, it was a very cheap piece of woodland and beach that um, uh, luckily my father took on um, and yes, so all those heady days of childhood, being on the beach and, and uh, seeing the bluebells coming up in the woods and the wooden enemies, it was a really, really evocative and nostalgic time, just especially looking back on it. Um, but yeah, it informed all my, all my uh, future inspirations, I would say. I think the Isle of Wight is a fantastic place for, for children to grow up, where you can really have that, that kind of almost Enid Blyton childhood where you're out roaming the mm. woods and yeah, the beaches lovely. being completely carefree, getting muddy and dirty and collecting creepy crawlies in, in jam jars. I mean, was your childhood like that? I would say so, yes. I, I, I was more of a shell collector <laughs> and a wild wildflower presser. <laughs> um, and I like pressing wild wow. Yes, I'd love to. You can't do that as much these days um, without much of a conscience. But then I and I love thing. I love books like uh, Watership Down, which was again it was all about wildflowers and all the names of the of the rabbits and things. Um, but yes, it was like that. We we saw a lot of what lot of uh, wildlife. We used to help my father fish. Um, Although that was that was to eat, <laughs> that was for necessity. Uh, but yes, beautiful squirrels. They have lovely red squirrels on the Isle of Wight. Um, Very elusive. I've only seen two. Oh really? <laughs> My oh, parents feed yeah. one actually. They, they, uh, there's one that comes down, takes the hazelnuts out of the little feeder. Um, but yeah, they're they're wonderful. Um, there's all sorts of foxes and badgers and everything. So yes, it was a wonderful childhood. Do you enjoy going back there? I love going back. Childhood memories. I mean, it's still a beautiful place um, in terms of the nature and how it, a lot of it's protected um, yes, uh, it by the National Trust. You know, you really can roam free in the far part of the island and mm. not run into anybody at times. 
Yes, it's a very special place. It's just such a different areas with different um, ecosystems. Yeah, ecosystems. Yes, you've got the south of the island, which is like a tropical haven, isn't it? <laughs> and then um, the north, and then the the hang on the west side. Yes, it's, it's, the water is more clear over there, and it's got a totally different feeling to to the east. It's it's very. I love it. I love the diversity of the island. How, how did how did that lead you to to become a, a composer and um, a singer and, and an artist? Did did you know very early on um, uh, as a as a child that you wanted to have an artistic life? Yes, I did actually. Um, my father taught me the piano. Uh, well, I loved just playing the piano because we had one at home, so I'd mess around on the piano, and he taught me till I was nine, and then I went to a piano teacher. And um, I think initially I'd look at things like Young Musician of the Year and think, oh, I want to do that because I didn't, didn't really, I, I used to compose music when I was young, um, but I never knew you could do it for a living, not, not at four or five years old uh, or even up to, the, to, to 10 years old. I didn't know that. Um, you were I just, composing music when you were yeah. that age. Yeah, very simple pieces, not as good as Mozart, but but I, I would do it. Um, it would come from somewhere and I'd just sit and noodle away at the piano and make up these tunes. And my mother would go, that's nice, darling. What's that? And I'd, and I'd say, oh, I made it up. And um, so I I did a lot of that. Uh, but I think... Did, the you, did you come from a musical family? Yes, sorry, yes, I did, actually. My father was a pianist um, and my mother... There was to... music in the house. Yes, very so it musical. Have been a lot of classical. An important, an important influence. What kind of music? Sarah? Oh, classical, classical music, really. Uh, well, classical music uh, was always played on the radio. Um, my mother was into, she liked classical music, but she, she, her background was all, you know, the Beatles and 60s music. And um, my father also loved all the kind of 40s, uh, which are the jazz standards today uh, that I've, you know, I've always dabbled with. Um, things like Every Time You Say Goodbye and those, those, those songs. And um, So all that permeated your consciousness? Yeah, so I had all of that as a tapestry behind me. So I, 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 I would sort of be a bit of a butterfly, not always practice what my teacher wanted me to, pre to play. Um, but I think that and getting into jazz piano and... and um, later on a bit more modern jazz made me much more aware of the different styles and I had I really had to actually focus one day and go where do I want to be what what do I want to play you know um, so in the end I decided to focus on my piano and, and focus on learning guitar that was later on um, Did you get involved in the music scene on the island because it's a very vibrant music scene Yes, well, it's funny, lots, really. Lots of yeah. bands and lots of yeah. uh, singers, pop like, writers. It's I really thought, vibrant. Yeah, it's very vibrant. Um, but it, it was more when I left the island, really. Um, but I mean, as far as growing up as a teenager, um, I was playing in. You know, I had had to do things like different. There was. I had to play the vi um, not the violin. I learnt the violin later, but I played the clarinet. So I had to play in a band for that um, and I had to do a lot of festivals. Uh, I remember playing a lot of Bach um, pieces for piano. And Were these classical work. festivals, Sarah? Classical festival. Well, actually they weren't all classical, no. They, they, they have a real variety of different styles. So I did a lot of those and then really got into jazz when I left and went to college. So... And, and who are you listening to? You know, as a as a teenager, what were you into? What were you excited about? That also fed into your creativity, into your music. I mean, well, were you listening to rock and and pop? No, I was a weird teenager. <laughs> I was into. I started off getting into um, people like uh, Oscar Peterson. Um, I I listened to a lot of jazz and things and then I got into I think I, I loved I remember probably one of the first things that I was listening to was um, Simon and Garfunkel and the Beatles and things like the White Album um, just 
don't, they were so amazing. In fact, I discovered them. We didn't have them at home. And I remember discovering them because I was babysitting at somebody's house and I found their entire record collection and I started playing them. I got so excited about listening to all these Beatles albums. And um, that's what really started me off in, in you know, the whole love of the Beatles. So yeah, there, there was a lot of that. But I just love really good melodies. Um, I really love classical music. It's still, I'm still glad my father made us listen to it when we were young because I think it's um, one of those things if you're used to that your ear gets accustomed to all sorts of music at an early age particularly classical then it's not as a difficult leap later on. So who, who are your classical favourites? Who are you in, inspired by then and, and now? Um, I love, I really love Mozart, I loved his, um, I still love his piano concertos um, and I love Janacek's music that was later on um, I love Bruckner um, but I think yeah I, there's so much beautiful music out there Anton Bruckner and Mahler um, I think particularly Mozart I think it's because his melodies are just so stunning and, and it's really emotively speak to you um, I know that everyone says, oh, Mozart, he's been played to death. And, <laughs> but it's you not... can ever, ever tire of Mozart. No, how could you? It's just, you couldn't, you couldn't. It's just uh, way too um, compelling and exciting the uh, moment you hear. Gorgeous, it's choral but, stuff. And there's so much, you know, Haydn, great music and his quartets. And, I um, always think of those classical, great classical composers as the rock stars. Of their day well, they were yeah it's so different to listening to queen no it isn't it's or, very the Stones or led zeppelin mm, that's very true yeah and that's why we find it so thrilling so exciting yeah i think you have yeah. to remember that um did you did you decide then as a teenager that you were going to have a musical career and, and did that scare or excite you because being an artist being a writer or a musician is never easy whatever age you're born into mm. it can be a tough and potentially insecure life yeah um it was exciting the thought of it but i i never as a teenager i never i never thought about the pitfalls of of being freelance or 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 entering to that kind of career only I mean it's probably my parents would always say oh it's very competitive the arts are very competitive and and I think really my main focus on leaving um, school was trying to get a job uh, any job in order to get a foothold in, in, and just have an income and then work because I worked at the BBC um, in order. This is after going to university. Yes, I had a, I did have a plan. I mean, I did a music. What did you What did you study at, at Trichester? I, I did music and related arts. So I had painting and art to, um, there and literature, but you you specialised in your main subject, which was for me it was improvisation and and music. Um, there was a mixture of jazz in there, but it was very free. So it was a sort of, uh, it was a degree where you could paint and you could do uh, your art, but you could mix the two together. So it was, I was actually doing paintings to music and music to paintings. That was part of the dissertation I did. Was, um, it, was it a great um, degree course? Did you enjoy it? I loved it actually, yes. It was really great. Um, and then it helped you to explore your- Yes, it did. creativity. It did very much as an artist. Yeah, it did because there was a big um, emphasis on in improvisation, and I I just took to that because that's what I love doing. A lot of other people I remember on the course got quite upset by taking the the musical dots away <laughs> um, because we you know we had to do that. For me, I just love anything that uh, is that freeing. So, yes, all my life was, I've always wanted to be free and always wanted to just go my own path. It's interesting, isn't it? I think if you really love what you do, you can operate with total freedom. But some people almost need to be told what to do and to have a lot of structure. Yeah, exactly. And that's good if, if, if because they get 
yeah. into that if it works for them to have the structure then that allows them to flourish in other ways with me i do need some structure but in probably my own self-imposed healthy routines as good structure um and started yes yeah, starting getting on with certain things but i'm quite disciplined anyway so um i think you tend to be as an artist if you want to get anything done yes exactly you have to so i do um i'm, I'm pretty deadly serious about my own work um and perfectionist about it uh, but yeah you'll come to different ways and find find your way of uh, of, of being and what works <laughs>